Hello, and welcome to the next episode of If Women Were Meant to Fly, The Sky Would Be Pink. To the rescue, I'm Enid O'Toon. In this episode, aviation accidents are on the increase, and I lose some very good friends. I am offered another job, and a contract is hard to refuse. And I experience my first piranha fish encounter on a company boat trip, which puts me off fish for life. Before I start this 20th episode, yes, 20 episode, which marks the end of season one, I want to say how grateful I am to all our listeners and followers for doing just that, listening and following my life story. It has been a pleasure to share the highs and lows, the rawness, honesty, sadness and elation with all of you. Season two will hopefully share more of the same. My aspirations for this podcast were not only to tell my life story, but to highlight the many things that accompanied me as my journey progressed. The homophobia, misogyny, prejudice and trauma, which all form part of my story from childhood to adulthood. I was hopeful that I could reach out to people who may have experienced any of the same things I did, who may have previously struggled or who are struggling now with some hope and strength and support. If I have been able to reach even just one person with a word, a thought and experience, then my job would be done. I have used the medium of what I know best, aviation, to share my story. But that is just the vehicle. So as I continue on this journey, I am excited to share more of my life with you all. With the growth of aviation in Nigeria, we were introducing more and more aircraft and more and more players in the field of company ownership. More wet lease aircraft were arriving, many from Eastern Europe, where the aircraft and the crew were leased as a package. Sometimes it seemed that proper precautions were not adhered to with catastrophic consequences. On November 28th, 1983, a Nigeria Airways Fokker F-28 Fellowship jet crashed on final approach to Enugu Airport, which is in the east of Nigeria, where the visibility was below the minimum descent altitude due to thick fog. The crew elected to continue in spite of this, and the aircraft crashed, killing 53 people, including two crew. On January 10th, 1987, A DC-10 belonging to Nigeria Airways was carrying out a training flight at Ilori, which is 130 nautical miles north of Lagos. The crews were carrying out touch-and-goes, where the aircraft lands and then immediately takes off again for another circuit, essentially to practice landings. With the aircraft high on the approach, and a situation rapidly developing where a decision was to be made regarding abandoning the landing to try again, Coupled with apparent confusion on the flight deck with regard to procedure and decision-making, the visibility too close to the minimums, the aircraft made a heavy landing and overran the runway, which resulted in a fire which was not adequately contained by the airport fire service. All nine crew members, including the instructor and the trainees, survived. Training procedures, operating procedures airport facilities and regulation all needed to improve as aviation grew, and this was not happening fast enough. As experience grew, it was tempting to think that you could push the boundaries of both your knowledge and the aircraft in order to achieve a successful outcome. However, many times this proved not to be the case. Airmanship and adherence to the rules, as well as a healthy respect for Mother Nature who could provide ferocious weather, needed to be constantly followed. (music) 
Every time an accident happened, my heart would skip a beat. The aviation community was still a relatively small one in those days, and it was likely that you knew the crew. With search and rescue services very poor at the time, it was also likely that you may be involved in some way in trying to provide assistance. Unbeknownst to me, I would, in the years to come, experience more and more of this type of loss. With the private sector becoming busier, the resultant requirement for more flights grew. I was at work more and home less. I also spent a lot of time in restaurants and cafes. Often I could be found in the Aero Contractors restaurant further up the ramp from us. It served good food and was a place to meet colleagues from different companies. The crews from different operations would often come together to meet and impart urgent and relevant information from their flights around the country. The state of navigation aids, fuel availability as well as airport and runway conditions as well as helpful company frequencies were just some of the information that was freely distributed for onward transmission to crews who flew the length and breadth of the country. This was often the surest and simplest way of adding relevant information to charts and procedures before it was made official by the relevant authorities. On one such occasion, one of the Aero Contractors' training captains was present and introduced himself to me. We got talking about our respective schedules, and before long he inquired about what it was like working at Bristow's, with the shell requirements for experience being so high. I replied honestly that, as I was close to this goal now, it would remain to be seen how they handled the promotion of co-pilots who had risen through the ranks. Nothing was a given, but I was hopeful that they would see the worth of the crews they had helped to develop. I had just taken a large bite out of my ham and cheese toasty when he said, Come work for us. You'll be a captain very quickly and possibly a training captain after that. I have heard only good things about you and I can guarantee you a command. I spluttered and proceeded to turn bright red as I weighed up an offer that I had not expected, with the possibility of choking to death on my toasty before I'd given him an answer. What just happened? He could tell I was shocked and asked why. Did I not realise that I was sought after? I replied that I didn't have the faintest idea that the community felt that way. He left me to think on it and said to take my time. When I was ready... I could start immediately. I sat there in a strange sort of trance. This was a milestone in my development and I needed time to process. I don't remember thinking at the time, wow, this is such a coup for women in this industry, but I think I knew deep down inside that it was. It was a simple engagement, but little did he know that it had meant so much. I had a decision to make, but I wasn't going to rush. First, I was going to take a much-needed weekend off, and for this, I had been invited to join our avionics engineers, along with a couple of maintenance engineers, to go on a boat trip. The company owned a small motorboat, which was managed and maintained by the engineers, and was sitting at the Lagos Motorboat Club in the heart of Lagos. I knew this place well. As a child, my father had also owned a motorboat, and it had been moored here as well. We would often take trips out onto the water, although, at the time, I had not enjoyed the experience. Founded in 1950, even then it was a prestigious club, and still is today. Launching into Lagos Lagoon, our route would take us under the Ahmadu Bella Road Bridge, an area of the choppiest water I had ever experienced. It was here that I would often lose my stomach contents and clutch at my life jacket. I could fly a plane through the most ferocious storms, but my sea legs were absent, possibly because I didn't have any. Out past the Lagos Yacht Club, it would be calmer, but busier, as we navigated towards a papa on the way to Badagri Creeks. Sometimes we would stop off at a popular beach area called Tarqua Bay, where we would moor in the shallows whilst beach boys, uh, not the actual beach boys, but hired youngsters who acted as porters, would come out to retrieve your cool box full of beer, coke and an assortment of other picnic favourites. I hated this bit, simply because as a poor swimmer I had to navigate a short stretch where my feet didn't touch the sand and I always managed to inhale a vast quantity of salt water. Yuck. At other times we would head out to our newly procured beach hut which was situated further into the creeks. I, I think it was called Debeshe. 
These days, there are many resorts in that area, but in our day, there were very, very few and they were very underdeveloped. You would hire someone to make sure your beach hut or canopy or structure was cleaned and staffed when you got there. And on the plus side, it was a calm and serene location with few hawkers to bother your tranquility. I remember spending many hours there relaxing in a place which could have been anywhere with good company and good beer. Happy days. On our way back to Lagos, we often had to pass through some very shallow areas of the Badagri Creek, which often necessitated abandoning the boat to push it off a sandbank. I hated not knowing what was beneath my feet when I jumped into the murky water. And once we were off the sandbank, you had to be pretty quick jumping back into the boat. That wasn't my strong point. I remembered instances from my primary school days when I was trying to catch jellyfish by the Lagos Lagoon waters, which my school looked out on, and being carefree and blasé about it and until I was told about the sting a jellyfish could deliver. My colleagues decided at that moment to remind me that these waters harboured piranha fish, and it was best not to take your time getting back onto the boat after a sandbank incident. I didn't believe them. The creeks looked too tranquil for that. But they did tell me about the myriads of piranha fish that surrounded the offshore drilling rigs and that they sometimes showed up in the local lagoons just waiting for an unsuspecting hand or foot being trailed in the water as you approached the bridge entry back to the boat club. Unfortunately, they decided to impart that information whilst I was inadvertently trailing my hand in the water at that very point with my beer goggles on. You will not have and will never see a person remove their limbs from the water so fast that the very momentum of this action propels them across the small boat and out over the other side before my colleagues could grab a hold of me. I went from inebriated to sober in about five seconds flat as I flew out of the boat and into the piranha-infested water. I flailed about, shrieking and swallowing great gulps as my colleagues tried to stop laughing long enough to effect my rescue. <laughs> Having been retrieved, I sat wrapped in a towel, frantically counting my fingers and toes, looking like a drowned rat. Lucky, said one, fish would have got you. I remember thinking for the safety of the dock that if I ever had to perform an emergency landing, I would do everything in my power to glide onto the beach because knowing my luck, I would be the only pilot in history to be consumed by a piranha fish. What an undignified end that would have been. And it wasn't a first I was in a rush to lay claim to. Thank you for listening. As always, your reviews and comments are very much appreciated. Thank you to Lucy Ashby for the editing of this episode. If you want to ask a question or make a comment, please do so on our social media sites. We're on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter or send us an email. Our email address is theskyispinkpilot at gmail.com or visit our website www.skyispink.co.uk. We have reached our 20th episode, and as we end Season 1, I am looking forward to more of my adventures in Season 2. To begin Season 2, in the next episode, I am pulled in many directions by job offer indecision, I experience more sexist abuse as I become a more senior crew member, and I welcome more women pilots into our slow-growing fold. Thank you, and goodbye.